Do I Realize I Create My Own World? by Pascal Bauté. My wife, Jeanette, had an aunt who had a fresh, warm gingerbread treat waiting for her every day as she walked home from school. Aunt Susan's place was a stopover before Jeanette had to cross a mountain to get home. This was in rural Appalachia in eastern Kentucky. Aunt Susan was totally blind and poor, but she regarded herself as rich. She did everything without a fuss, including having to follow a string to get from the house to the outhouse. She was never heard to criticize anyone. Jeanette said Aunt Susan was positive about everything. She never complained, and she was a great role model for all her brothers and sisters. Although born blind and poor, Aunt Susan coped every hour, minute by minute, with what she had, and she coped well. She knew she was creating her own reality by how she reacted. It takes a long time, a heap of living, as some would say, to wake up to the reality of ourselves. For many reasons, mortals tend to idealize themselves, pretending they are more than they are. Invariably, professors, politicians, and psychologists believe themselves to be in the upper half of their peer group. They are better than average in their own minds, while a reality check reveals them to be less than average. In like manner, we are not good judges of our behavior. Without setbacks, without failures, without some darkness, we cannot mature. Failure is the great teacher. This is why the realizations at midlife are so important and critical for our future wellness and happiness. The basic axiom of Psychology 101 is that all perception is selective. That is, we cannot view anything from an objective standpoint. We are bound to be influenced in our perception by our past experience, our values, and the frame of reference we bring to any moment. Sad persons will find reason to be sad. The same is true of glad persons and angry persons, who will find things in their environment to be glad and angry about. Likewise, the happy person will find things to be happy about. Jeanette has another relative who cannot go to anyone's house without finding some fault. Your grass is too tall. Did you know you have poison ivy there? That picture on the wall looks funny. The relative is quick to give advice. He maintains his sense of being okay by finding fault with almost anything. Meaning well and personally generous, he honestly thinks he is superior in his standards, but he is oblivious to the effect he has had on others. He can dominate a conversation without even realizing it. He looks for and finds something he has an opinion about. He must continue proving that he is better than by criticizing. Still another of my wife's relatives thought the same, but was more introverted. In her own mind, she was perfect. However, after a few beers and following a large family gathering, her critical judgments about the event could be shared. Because she was so ready to judge, she quickly but wrongly assumed others were being critical of her. Each of the aforementioned persons maintained a sense of superiority by finding fault. It was an inner world each was continually creating. Those who create such an inner world can only possess gratitude when it is based upon feeling that they are better than others. When, according to my survey research, so many veterans, 50%, arrive for their VA appointments with a negative attitude, could it be that, in their mind, they have decided they are somehow getting the short end, sucking on some grievance? The only way the few chronically angry veterans I have met could maintain that attitude was by finding new probable reasons for grievance. Each was creating the reality in which they live. In their mind, their anger was always justified. A recent experience at a BRC dining room table confirmed that again for me. I sat next to a blinded veteran who carried a chip on his shoulder. He found many things to be upset about. Another veteran loudly announced to anyone listening, as soon as he lifted the cover to his meal tray, quote, another piece of S blank, unquote. Although we promise solemnly in our marriage vows to love the other, quote, as long as we both shall live, unquote, one half of all marriages in the USA now end after seven years. Additionally, according to the Centers for Disease Control, which tracks these things, the rate of divorce is not much better for second marriages. What has happened? The answer is that we encounter parts of our partner that we did not know before and are not able to cope with that disappointment over time. Partners do not have the needed listening and conflict resolution skills. We end up harboring negative feelings that become resentment. Holding resentment slowly poisons the relationship. We choose what we focus on every day. This is what makes our reality. We supply the content of what goes on between our ears. When we grasp this single important fact, we become aware of how we focus our attention. Do we easily give free rent to bad stuff? What side of the bed do we get up on? More importantly, have we managed our lives so that we want to get out of bed to get started on something meaningful? Remember Aunt Susan, who Jeanette says she cannot remember being negative about anything? 
Or better, think of the Aunt Susan in your life who is weathering a setback or many setbacks. They choose the positive each moment. In my book, Blind Veterans Coping with Loss, I ask 32 veterans with sight loss where they find meaning and hope. They reveal 12 self-care values that reflect an attitude of knowing they are responsible for each moment of their lives. The perception of good stuff versus bad stuff is always before us. Both beauty and ugliness are each in the eye of the beholder. So, the choice each moment is which side will we choose? The side of remembering the hurt and setbacks, or the side of counting each new moment as a blessing? Knowingly or not, we put our finger on the scale every day and every moment. It is up to each of us to decide to dance, that is, to find joy, celebration, and gratitude in our lives.